welcome to the Alex Salmon Show from Scotland, where we discuss economic recovery from the pandemic. Alex interviews Professor David Blanchflower of Ivy League Dartmouth College, New Hampshire, to discuss whether there are early signs of a Biden-led recovery in the United States. Biden's hope is that the low-end folks will actually get out and spend and support him. The talk is that this measure will actually have the biggest impact on child poverty of any measure since Roosevelt, since the New Deal. This is something focused on the low end, going to impact relatively poor people, help states, help schools, um, focused on real things. So I think it's quite interesting and didn't get a single vote from a Republican in the Senate. All of that and more to come. But first, to your tweets, emails and messages in response to our show last week on Trump and is the party over? Where we spoke to Rina Shah, who is an anti-Trump Republican and Ed Martin, a pro-Trump Republican. Philip says, Trump and what he stands for is far from over. The voices of people that believe in freedom will not be silenced and the old system of lies will be torn down. Margaret says, I think four years of Biden could see him make a comeback, to be honest. To which Hamish says, definitely, if the Democrats don't start delivering on their promises and reform the Senate so that things can actually get passed, then another Trump-style demagogue is going to topple them in 2022 and 2024. Finally, Eileen Kennedy says, I watched him the other night. He didn't say one way or another if he'd run again, but still peddling the line that the election was rigged. Utter nonsense. And now to the big interview. During the last recession of over a decade ago now, Professor David Blanchflower was a lone voice on the Bank of England Monetary Policy Committee urging for a more aggressive monetary response to the global recession. So what tools are in the policy box now to stimulate economic recovery from COVID? Over to Alex and Professor David Blanchflower. Professor David Blanchflower, welcome back to the Alex Salmon Show. Always great to come and talk to you, Alex, on interesting days. Now, looking at the world economy now, some countries seem to have had a much sharper fall in output than others. I mean, China, where the, the virus originated, has already surpassed its previous peak output levels. So other countries, like the UK, you know, lost 10% last year and are going to struggle to recover that even into next year. Why the difference between various economies in terms of the impact of the COVID recession? Obviously, some of it, a great deal of it, has to do with lockdown. It has to do with how the government responded. So the response in the UK, where you allow people to be furloughed, which keeps the unemployment rate down, um, discourages firms from producing. So the workers are paid money, um, output drops. Um, so that's, that's part of it. So it's about responses from government. It's about the nature of the economy that people are in um, and, and essentially whether people can, could continue working um, under the situation where the virus is present. Um, and obviously, there's, I mean, you're right to say that GDP dropped a lot in the UK. But actually, look at unemployment. Look at unemployment in the United States. Unemployment in March was around 4%. And in April, it was 20%. So we have, so yeah, some good indicators in terms of output. But employment and unemployment have been particularly bad in the United States, which in many ways explains the need for the Biden stimulus that I know we're going to get to talk about. So let's talk about President Biden. Is there emerging from the Biden... White House, a, a new economics? Is he the, the Roosevelt of the, the modern era? Well, I think, I, I think to some extent the answer to that is yes. This is actually focused on the low end. Biden's hope is that the low end folks will actually get out and spend and support him. I think one thing, Alex, that I know you've been interested in, the talk is that this measure will actually have the biggest impact on child poverty of any measure since Roosevelt, since the New Deal. So I think the answer is that people at the low end, very, this is very focused on people at the low end. And in some sense, what's interesting is that the Republicans voted against it, but it's actually really popular amongst Republicans who are going to benefit from it. So we have a very interesting political thing where you vote against the interests of the people who vote for you. Um, so I think it's, and it's the most popular measure we've seen in a very long time. So the answer is, 
This is something focused on the low end, going to impact relatively poor people, help states, help schools, um, focused on real things. So I think it's quite interesting and didn't get a single vote from a Republican in the Senate. And in terms of the financing of the Biden recovery package, uh, is there a aspect where they say, well, you know, debt levels will just have to rise even further uh, in order to make sure that we keep the economy moving and get people back into work? Well, I think the, the classic... The classic story, in a sense, that, that I was writing about in 2009 and 10, Skidelsky has written about, which is that in a slump, you, you don't worry about the debt, you worry about activity. Um, and if we look back, on, look, look back under Clinton, under the great Clinton boom, deficits were being paid off, the debt was being paid off. Um, the reality is two things. Debt is really cheap right now, so the rate of return from borrowing essentially at zero is high. And then the other thing, and the debate in the UK has been about that, the central bank is buying huge chunks, huge chunks of these of the government debt that's been um, issued. The worry always is that if you do that, if you print money, then that will generate inflation. But if there's a huge deflationary shock of the kind that we have, that's what you want to do. If deflation is what's coming in, you put an inflationary shock in there to prevent us to go into deflation. So the answer is this is precisely the right thing to do in the slump. And, and the people all are arguing uh, and have argued to me a hundred times on TV shows like yours, inflation's coming. And I always go, well, when? You said it last time. You said it last 38 times that I was on this program. There isn't any inflation. What we care about is employment, unemployment and jobs. Um, and that's why you need the stimulus. And that's why economists pretty much across the board think a stimulus should happen. And this is not the time for reckless, failed austerity, which was applied in the, in the, in the depths of recession in the UK, generated the slowest recovery in 300 years. So I'm absolutely supportive of it. Um, it looks like it's going to be popular and boost the economy. So let me take you back uh, a decade. When, when you're sitting on the Monetary Policy Committee of the Bank of England and then vote after vote, you're a, a lone voice saying, no, <laughs> austerity and belt tightening is not the way forward. Let's get a, a recovery underway. If interest rates had been as low then as they are now, do you think you would have had any supporters? Has there been a realisation that that wasn't the way ahead? Looking back, it's pretty hard to understand why why people didn't see it, and what, I mean, it was blindingly obvious. So I guess you'd have to ask them. I mean, people have said to me, oh, it wouldn't have made any difference. Absolutely, it would have made a difference if we'd have understood that, you know, but banks were going to fail in this recession. You shouldn't have allowed lamers to fail. You should have done things to prevent Northern Rock and Royal, Royal Bank of Scotland and, and Lloyd. So I think the answer was, if you'd have got your retaliation in first, it, life would have been much better. And so it, you know, for people to argue, if we, we had seen it wouldn't have made any difference, that it was Danny's fault because he wasn't persuasive enough, were all rather ridiculous arguments. And essentially, that's where we are. Remember, Alex, that there's that the two things as well. The scale of this shock today and the speed at which it happened was even greater than in, the, than in 2000. It took about, you know, it took a year or so to really get down into, into recession. It caught, caught, a, caught a month this time. So that, that was unprecedented. But remember, now we have the experience of missing it in 2008. So at least you can say, you know, you should have listened. You should have realized a year ahead of time that this was going on. And you should have realized that the austerity that you implemented was a disaster. Don't do it this time. I mean, I just would go back one last thing. I remember Rachel Lomax, who was a great member of the committee, said to me that one, the one thing perhaps that the biggest mistake the MPC made was not listening to me about what happened in America. So what happened in America spread around the world. So maybe, in a sense, this huge stimulus, maybe that will have a positive effect on everybody else, because if America's booming, that has, it has repercussions elsewhere. But America's really important. Now, obviously, you keep a, a, a good watch on the, the, the Chancellor's budget uh, over the last week. Uh, and it seems to be a curious mix of a fairly heavy continuing stimulus with the threat of a substantial increase in the, the tax ratio in, in times to come. Uh, it's almost uh, it's, it's uh, not so much jam today and austerity tomorrow 
as uh, trying to disguise the jam today. It seems a very unusual approach to uh, economics to try and underplay your stimulus uh, and allow the consequences to be in the in the few years' time. What do you think he's up to, the, the Chancellor of the Exchequer? Um, I, th I think he looks absolutely clueless. I mean, I think... I mean, the answer is that you, pre you prepare for the worst and hope for the best. He doesn't seem to have actually understood what, what recovery is going to look like. The right thing is we do not know what long-run changes in behaviour are going to come, and we do not know after the, these schemes are taken away what proportion of firms are going to survive. Think the workers are on furlough. You bring them back from furlough, does the firm survive? So the answer is that you certainly should default on the side of doing too much, and if inflation rises, we know what to do about it. So it's really, I agree with you, you sort of continue this stuff and you say, yeah, but we've got to get back to austerity, we've got to hurt the poor, and we've got to lower it, because it's really just as in 2010, it really was the poor, the disabled, single mothers, um, and uh, old people's homes and libraries that caused the Great Recession. So I think the answer is that, you know, basically you, you, you have somebody who doesn't really seem to understand that the way out of a recession is to do more. And you're right, weird combination of yeah we'll do furloughing but we're going to lower raise corporation tax really no i don't think so so i agree with you very weird combination of things it's, it felt like but eventually i've got to get back to do austerity so we can do all that stuff again and reduce the role of the state i thought it was a very strange budget um, that will have to be reversed as all the others have been <laughs> pretty quickly well in the chancellor's defense and why shouldn't I have a word of his defence? He doesn't seem to be going down the traditional line of slashing capital expenditure. Indeed, there's a, a good deal of encouragement in his budget for company capital spending. Is there a, an aspect there where, where you can detect a lesson perhaps has been learned, that uh, this is rather a good time for many, many reasons to be encouraging and, of course, committing capital expenditure as a government? Well, the one thing that we didn't really he hear much about, which is about, well, let's try and get capital projects moving quickly. I mean, okay, you say, I'm going to build a railway. Well, that takes 20 years to get to be completed. Um, and you and I, I remember in, 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 the, in the start, uh, just after the Great Recession, we talked about shovel-ready projects. And, and I thought you did really very well. You got out really quickly and you said, let's go find projects that have already been given public approval. They got through the planning process and they're waiting to get funded. And I remember you set up a website. I loved it. You set up a website and you said, I've got a billion quids worth of stuff. Fund it now. We'll start it. Where did I hear that? Have I heard that from Suna? No. And I remember we actually, I remember actually, People asked David Cameron at the time, do you have a list of projects that are ready to go? And the answer was no. And that was a, 10 years ago, and Sunak doesn't appear to have done that. I mean, why didn't he just fund? If there's, if there's a hospital that's approved or a roundabout or a bypass or something, why don't you just do that? Shovel ready means you have to have your brain ready. You have to decide that this is an important thing to do. Infrastructure just takes a really long time. Um, and, and it's a sensible thing to do because it gets the economy pumping again. Join us after the break where Alex continues his discussion with Professor David Blanchflower on economic recovery from the pandemic. We'll see you then. Welcome back to the show. Alex is in discussion with Professor David Blanchflower of Ivy League Dartmouth College, New Hampshire, USA. Uh, Professor David Blanchflower, when we look back to the, the 1930s, in, in politics, uh, FDR emerged with the practical application of a new economics. Uh, and John Maynard Keynes uh, put forward a general theory and put forward a new, a new philosophy of economics, a new body of thought. Do you see the, the same thing emerging now uh, of a, a new body of thought which is addressing current circumstances and the current crisis? So what's happened today? Well, what we've seen in the last decade is basically no inflation, no wage growth, austerity failed. Um, the, th the idea that inflation was really the ogre that we needed to care about had really, has really gone. So there is a battle, among, in the, if you like, within economics for the hearts and minds, not least because basically economics missed the Great Recession. 
Um, the models didn't have a financial sector in them. The assumption was that markets would perfectly price things. So the answer is yes, that obviously given that failure, economics kicking and screaming is going to have to do something. Um, but the other, in a sense, the big deal related to, to Biden today and a, a several of the Republican ad, a chairman of the Economic Council of Advisors to the president have come around to the view that, that debt matters less than we thought, that debt to GDP ratios really, I mean, the, the, the argument was just shown to be false with it, debt to GDP above 90% will lower out, but that was crass nonsense. So that whole realization that, you know, that the old order can still be applied, kicking and screaming is changing. So the answer is that it's going to transform economics. It slowly is. And particularly about the labor market, um, governments have really got the labor market wrong. And the Fed admitted, and I argued with them endlessly when they kept raising rates because the economy was at full employment, that it wasn't. And now they've recognized that that's the case. So the answer is that kicking and screaming, but slowly, we are moving there. And this stimulus by Biden was broadly supported by economists, which certainly was not the case in 2010. But of course, any recession has disproportionate effects and they vary from country to country. Uh, you made the point earlier that you could have a, a sharp decline in output but still be protecting the workforce. Will we see in the, as we emerge from uh, this recession that, that there'll be a premium on uh, protecting the people, increasing sustaining productive potential, or, or will the, the balance sheet economics prevail once again uh, and people will be left in a scrap heap. Well, obviously, Alex, that's, that's the worry, but I'm, I am encouraged by the fact that this measure um, by Biden is designed to, I mean, it really is designed to help, to help people who make under $70,000 a year. That's not been true before. The, the previous one was a tax cut for billionaires. This is a tax cut for ordinary people. So I think the answer is that distribution matters Hurting people have been hurting a lot, and governments at their peril, I think, um, are going to essentially going to ignore that. Um, and in a way, the other thing is that people's long-run behaviour is going to change. They're going to probably save more. They're going to worry about how they, you know, what happens to granny. Are you going to put them in an old people's home? All of that stuff. So it's hard to believe that we're going to just go back to where we were in 2020. Or in 2007. I think a new order is coming. And how does the science of economics match up to the experience of the people? I mean, you've been the pioneer of walkabout economics to, to take into account uh, the common sense of the, of the public when applying your economic ideas. How do you do that in the middle of a lockdown, Professor Blanchflower? Isn't it quite difficult to go walking about and finding that common sense? Well, obviously, none of us have done much walking about for a really long time. So I, I've had to call it now the walking about the Internet because, <laughs> you know, the, the, the legs are not as active as they used to. I, I walk a lot and bike a lot more now. Um, the, the reason why walk about economics is really important. If you look back to 2008 and you looked at what people said, you looked at what firms said, you looked at what people said and you looked at it, let's say, late in 2007. It was blindingly obvious that a recession was coming. So walk about economics is about listen to what people, talk to people, listen to, and firms, listen to what they say and take it seriously. So we're in a new world. Uh, and the interesting question will be, given people have taken this huge shock, what will they do? What effects will that have? And to argue, as members of the MPC have done, that we can just kind of get back to normal makes no sense. Firms, firms are not just going to get back to normal because they don't know, are people going to, are going to stop commuting? Are they going to carry on buying things on Amazon? Are they going to not go to restaurants? Are they going to not commute anymore? Are they going to stick in their country? All that stuff. But the economics of walking about is actually the only way you're really going to find this out. Think, think about what we do in forecasting hours. You're in this business. What we do is we look back in history, we look at events that have occurred like this, and we say, OK, extrapolated from that, we think this. You have no data point. We have no data points anywhere in the world of this kind where happiness has collapsed. So we better go and ask people what they're going to do. And that turns out to be an honourable estate. Talk to firms, think about what they're going to do, talk about their plans, 
and take seriously what they say. And it turns out that's a better way of understanding the economy than silly theory that, that, that I used to listen to in, in meetings at the NPC, which sounded to me like theology rather than how the world actually works. So this is about trying to understand how the world works by immersing yourself in it. And as first minister, that's what you used to do, right? You would immerse yourself and try to work out what's going on. And I think that's a role that economists can now play. And that's what Keynes did. He looked around, understood what was going on and came up with a, um, a model which told us how, how to do better. So I think that's the benefit of economics of walking about. And it turns out it's taken off. <laughs> Behavioral economics is a huge new field. And would the derisory 1% pay offer to the nurses in the United Kingdom be an example of that? Uh, I mean, it probably sounds good in the, the Treasury to talk about public sector pay restraint, but to a population who have just been put their lives in the hands of the, the National Health Service, uh, insulting the nurses seems like a very bad idea. In your guts, you know it's nuts. So perhaps if the Chancellor did a bit more walking about, he'd come to terms with that reality. Alex, I mean, there, there is, I, I understand there was a little bit of economics of walking about to be done. Apparently, the French were in the same position, right? The French, they relied on the nurses and so on, and there was similar public approval for them. They, they, this week, apparently, they offered a 10% pay raise. I mean, it just, it just seems mean-spirited. I mean, it makes little sense, right? These people have put their lives in a position. Many of them, many of them lost their life. People got sick. The public, the public surely values this. Brexit has ended up meaning a lot of people left, a lot of people, foreigners who worked in the UK actually left. So in many senses, there's a shortage. And when there's a shortage of people and the demand for them has risen, I mean, simple economics should, should suggest that you raise the price. I mean, what, what, what's the talk since then? The talk is that people will leave the profession people will move to other countries and the quality of the service will decline further and you're less ready for the next shot that comes along. Mm, not really very, not really very hard. And the amount of money, Alex, I mean, let's suppose you went to 10% rather than one. The amount of money is actually pretty trivial. I mean, I remember, I remember once Gordon Brown said to me, Danny, remember that 1% of GDP is a really big number. In a way, re rewarding the nurses, making the population healthier. I mean, he's right. If you can, if you can impact one percent of GDP, that's an awful lot of money in people's pockets. So I think that's the answer. It just looks, it just looks, it's beyond mean spirit. It just looks dumb. And finally, Danny, let's talk about the big question: uh, the aftermath of the the Great Recession of uh, two thousand and nine ten. It was a prolonged period of uh, austerity in many countries, uh, which resulted in lost output, wasted lives. What's going to be the impact of this big COVID recession? Is there going to be a, a sharp recovery or is there going to be austerity again with lost output for a, a generation to come? Well, the, the worry, Alex, is that it's that. The scale of the shock, let's put it in reality, the scale and the speed of the shock was much greater than we've seen basically ever before. Um, and the likelihood is that people's behavior will change. Firms will be wary about investment, investing, and perhaps firms will be very wary because of the possibility of another pandemic coming in the future. So the answer is, I think this is likely because of the sheer scale of the thing. And it's not just a British problem, it's a global problem. Um, the global economy has, has been hit, the France and Germany and so on, that, that they've been hit. So it's not just is there a change in long run behavior in the UK, it's well, what about in the United States? What about in France and Germany and Japan and Italy and so on? Is, are, are there global changes in things? And the answer in big economies, it takes a long time for economies to adjust. So my suspicion will be that it's gonna be worsened by potential errors once again on the part of fiscal authorities. And the reason that it's so important is, I mean, I remember people used to say to me, Danny, the year from 2010 to 2020 were the years of the central banker. They're not anymore. The central bank can't cut rates below zero. So the responsibility falls on the British chancellor. I have great confidence in a way in the US 
that my friend Janet Yellen is sitting there in the treasury. She's a labor economist, fantastic record on, on you know, academic record. She gets it. I mean, I've talked to her lots of times. She gets exactly what you and I have talked about. She's talked about jobs and the need for stimulus and the need to get focused on this stuff. So I feel like the benefit for the, for the world is that you have Janet Yellen sitting at the US treasury. I couldn't have picked a better person. Um, unclear to me that anybody of that caliber is advising the British government. I think it's really important for us to understand this new world order, have people in place who understand it, not go back to people who, who basically failed in the past and are gonna try and use those things. We need new creative thinking focused on particularly people at the low end, especially the people at the low end who have been impacted the most by the pandemic. So I think that, that and I think in political terms, we're probably gonna see that to be really important. So slow recovery. The question is, are politicians going to be on the right side or the wrong side of it? Professor David Blanchefleur, with the economic wisdom gained from walking about on the internet, thank you once again for joining me on the Alex Salmon Show. Excellent. Always good to talk to you, Alex. Just over a decade ago, Professor Danny Blanchefleur provided me with invaluable advice as First Minister of Scotland on how to use fiscal stimulus uh, through shovel-ready projects uh, to tackle recession. Now in country after country, the emphasis has moved to monetary policy, with countries taking advantage of historically low interest rates in order to issue more debt to fight recession. And as populations uh, across the planet emerge blinking into the post-lockdown sunlight, then tension will turn to the bread and butter issues. And in tough economic times, people ask their politicians the age-old question, what is to be done? Those politicians with an answer will prosper. Those who haven't will sink. And so for Tasmina, myself and all at the show, it's goodbye for now. Stay safe. We'll see you again next week. <laughs>